Hi, and welcome back to our show, uh, Health for Being and Lifestyle. Our first guest today is Helen Mack, and she's this is part of the series Optimizing Outcomes. And take, today she's talking about taking action. So welcome, Helen. Thanks, Linda. Can you just start us off by how people would start taking action? Sure. So we've talked about creating clarity, we've talked about maximising momentum, and we've talked about maintaining mindset. And all of that is fantastic, but if you're only thinking about it, then nothing's going to change. So without action, all we have is contemplation and thinking never made anything occur. I think some people get into what I call analysis paralysis. They spend so much time thinking about which should I do and what's the best thing to do that they don't realise that by simply choosing to act, they bring in some power from the universe that somehow supports and helps you then take the next step. So, so important, isn't it, for yeah. us to think about that overthinking takes over so easily in life. And it's exhausting because you spend your whole time trying to sort out the priorities and which is the best thing and have I, can I and have I and just asking all these questions that end up with you going into a spiral and nothing happens. And then you start beating yourself up about all the things you should do. I call it shoulding all over yourself. You know, I should do this and I should do that. It doesn't, none of that matters. All you need to do is just take a small positive step forward. And the wonderful thing that happens then is that you get feedback. So you take a tiny step and the universe gives you feedback. That was a great decision, Helen, keep going. Or, oh, I don't think so. And you'll get uh, obstacles and things that make it really, really difficult. And then key piece is to watch for those, to, to be, notice those messages and go, mm, this is seeming like it's really, really hard. Maybe I should just pause and take a slightly different direction. So I like to use, this is going to give away my age, but I like to use the example of push starting a car. Now there are going to be some of our viewers who go, what are you talking about? Because you can't push start automatics. But in the days of manual cars, you had to get the car into momentum before you could change direction. You had to take action. You had to put some input in to, to get an outcome. And it's the same with whatever goals you're at. Um, you may have, your visitors may, your viewers may have noticed if they've been watching that I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of orange. And the other analogy that I love to use is that you can't get orange juice from an orange by looking at it. You actually have to do something. You have to squeeze. And I think life's a bit like that. You don't get the juice out of life if you don't give it a good squeeze. On that path where we, you know, people can get caught up in this positive thinking thing, you were talking about that earlier. Um, what would you, what's your take on affirmations and, and that sort of perspective? I think that one of the challenges that I have with affirmations is that when a lot of people teach affirmations, they teach you to talk in the current tense about things that are going to happen in the future tense. And I think that a lot of people struggle with that because my brain goes, no, I'm not. You know, I say, I'm, I'm tall and fit and healthy and, blah, and my, little, my little voice says, no, I'm not. So I like the, if I'm going to make statements about my future, I use action words, verbs, like I'm working towards, or I'm taking steps towards, or I'm um, becoming rather than I am, because my brain fights with me. If I say I am something that I'm working towards, I li literally have the little voice going, no, you're not. And so I think that's um, a problem. Now, I'm an optimist by personality and by trade. I, that's what I teach the world, is how to be more optimistic. The problem with that thinking doesn't take, make anything happen. So, bad news for all of us. We cannot sit on the couch and think positively about the red Ferrari coming down the driveway. It's not gonna happen. The piece that's missing is what I call the action imperative. The only way to get that red Ferrari, if that's what you want, is to go out and do something to make that happen. And that's why I love optimism as an approach, because optimism has a built-in action imperative. The word itself, optimism, comes from optimus, which is Latin, the search for the good, the search for the best possible. And again, your viewers may remember that from our first episode. So the search for the best possible outcome is built into optimism. It doesn't mean that we are always um, sweetness and light and balloons and, and, and streamers. It means that we take a realistic look at what's going on. Where am I now? 
Where do I want to go? What's the best possible route for me to get there? And then what's the action I can take to move me towards that goal? I love that becoming. Mm -hmm. Because I, that's totally relevant for me in my in my journey. Uh, I could always have those arguments mm. with myself, and mm. then the overthinking is more compounded, isn't it? Correct. You kind of you're not feeling you're not feeling like that. So no. how can I how can I be that if I'm not feeling? Yeah, like I it? can't say I am no. when I'm not yet. Mm. So I'm becoming is a very powerful change of verb. So in regard to bigger things and and you know with that possibility thinking how can we what sort of action can we take towards that to get the best possible mm. scenario so i'm going to start with one that your viewers have probably heard before because i think a lot of people have heard how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time now i quite like that analogy except that i also like elephants so i don't like the idea of eating elephants i think the key is to take the tiniest possible step to activate what we talked about a couple of sessions ago around ma uh, maximizing momentum. Once we get into action, once we get into movement, like pushing that stalled car, once we get it moving, then we've got the chance to change direction. It's very hard to change direction from being st um, stopped, from being stationary. In any big project, the key is just to take that first tiny step. Once you get that tiny step, you'll get feedback, you'll have a chance to take more steps and more steps. One of my favourite sayings in this area was delivered to me by a very good friend, Max Dixon, and he said, just choose a single, simple, doable thing. Then you know you've done it, and then you can choose another one. Baby steps will still get you there. Oh, wonderful. Thanks so much, Helen, for joining us in this series. For more information on Helen and optimising outcome and today's taking actions on that, then please go to her web page on our website, healthwellbeingandlifestyle.com.au. And now we'll go to break and be back with another beautiful guest. Welcome back and we have George Gentilis, our somatic psychotherapist and today he's talking about healing trauma. Um, what is trauma, George? Yeah, big topic. Uh, trauma is uh, and basically an event that happens in your life where you felt like you, even for a second, perceived, even if it wasn't real, that you could have died. If there's one split second, you think, I could die here, that's the shock that's the trauma, it's just entered your body, where your body, your whole nervous system, uh, your whole physical body, organs, everything, uh, you felt like you could actually die for one second. Uh, and that could happen with a physical trauma, car accidents are a typical one, you see a car coming out, you, you brace for one split second, your brain thinks, oh, I could die here, and the car hits, you don't die, and then you're left with this shock uh, in the body that sometimes comes out naturally, sometimes doesn't. Uh, and if it doesn't, if it stays in your body, it leads to what we call PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, where months later you're still rehashing the event. It's like it happened yesterday and, uh, and your body can't release it. You can't relax or you feel heavy or you start to feel anxious or depressed for no reason. And uh, that's a trauma. That's a physical trauma. So we, we get a high impact in the body uh, then you've got developmental trauma, which is normally the childhood stuff where you got neglected or abandoned as a child or abused uh, physically. Sexual abuse is a big one, sadly. Uh, but we've got great methods now for healing a lot of that, which is that's the exciting part rather than just taking a pill, like I mentioned last time. Uh, and, uh, and, and sometimes trauma can be something gradual that happens in childhood where where a certain parent puts you down constantly, 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 and it doesn't look like anything much, uh, but 20 years later, you're like oh, weighed, weighed down by all this negative thinking, and it's an emotional trauma. That's a developmental emotional abuse, basically, uh, especially if that parent was alcoholic or they had a mental illness, uh, and you had to even support them. A lot of times, as a child, you have to grow up real quick to support them because they can't even look after you. Uh, that's very traumatic, very traumatic, and uh, that can lead to a lot of issues. But it gets stored in your body, and that's 
a fantastic thing that we've discovered in the last 15, 20 years. It's not a, just a thinking thing. You, you can go and talk to someone, talk to a counsellor. That's the best thing to do after a particular event. If something has just happened to you, say a car accident and you're shaken up by it, or you've had an operation that's shook you up or uh, because surgery is cutting the person's open, you, you, when you're getting cutting o cut open, you, the body thinks it's going to die you know, because it's being, there's a knife coming at it. So that's normal trauma. Uh, but if months go by and, and you're still weighed down by it and, and you've, all of a sudden all these different things start to happen in your life, reactions, uh, you start getting sick easier, uh, you're not sleeping properly. Uh, normally, you, we can trace that back to a particular event. And you go back to when you didn't have those um, uh, issues, normally, almost always, there'll be some major event that happened at that time. Could be a major divorce, a major breakup. That can be traumatic uh, when the, your partner you've loved all of a sudden turns on you. Uh, very traumatic. Would an yep. example be like, Somebody, somebody has something physical, actual feeling or a body motion or a, a leg having problems, or that, would, would that be signs of... Yes, would that be yes part definitely, of yeah. Yeah, especially if you start getting muscle tensions. Uh, neck is a common one. Legs, psoas muscle, uh, that, that fight-flight response that we talk about, that lower brain in your body, the sensory motor brain that needs to release that fight flight response. So if, you're, if you think you're in danger, for even just for a split second and you perceive it, oh, I might die here, your body wants to save itself. And how do you save yourself? You either run from the event or you fight. And uh, your body's gonna wanna do one or two of those or both. If you don't let it happen at the time because we've got a great intellect, we can block it off. When people feel a trauma, they'll hold their breath, tense up their muscles <laughs> uh, and that keeps it in. If you watch an animal in the wild, they won't keep it in. They'll go away and tremble and shake and uh, it, it'll come out. Uh, but we don't do that as human beings. We're civilized and it's great that we've got this intellect, which the animal kingdom doesn't have. Uh, but the negative side of that intellect is that we can knock, lock down this, this uh, fight flight response. So, so really what you want to do is allow your body to, to move and uh, let out that fight flight response. And, and it, becomes, it comes out as trembling, shaking, uh, twitches, jolts, uh, which is why it's very important to go to the gym. You got to go. That's the fight response when you do uh, resistance training, or boxing, or lifting um, dumbbells. Uh, you need that exercise where your body can feel like it's pushing, and, and then your nervous system feels like, ah, oh, now I'm safe. I can push away, and uh, and your body gets a chance to save itself. Basically, you have you, your body hasn't saved itself. You may have intellectually. You may have rationalised, oh yeah, the event happened in the past and you'll have friends around you telling you to get over it and you think, oh, I can't, yeah, I'm trying to get over it. And, but you've got all this weight in your body and what it is is an un uncompleted fight-flight response. Uh, so going to the gym is critical. Everyone should be going to the gym and doing something physical. Walking helps, little short bursts of runs. Uh, interval training is great. You know, even for 30 seconds on a stationary bike, go flat out and your nervous system can release that flight response and then it relaxes and then you, you sleep like a baby sort of thing. And right. Yeah, very important. Right. Very important. And what would it be a bit of advice for our viewers about if they did observe trauma or feel it for themselves? Yes, if you've had a trauma or even watching a movie on TV, a horror movie, and it traumatises you, you've got to come back to your body because not only is that fight-flight response blocked off, but people dissociate. So you, people leave their body and they feel like they're, they're, they're living up here or living to the side of the body if it's a real high impact problem, high impact accident, or if you had a lot of bullying at school, you really want to start to feel, come back into your body again. And a good way of that is just to pat your body, to feel it, breathe under your hand, and go out around your whole body, whole body, and just start to, to get a sense of, oh, I'm back in my body again. And as you come back into it, you'll get little jolts, little twitches, oh, little shakes, that's good. Right? That's not bad, doesn't mean there's something wrong with you, that's really good because your nervous system is finally, that lower brain is finally getting to oh, finally relax, shake, 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 relax, shake, 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 relax, and, and, and just recover. You, know, you get peace of mind comes back and the weight lifts because your nervous system isn't trying to run or, or fight. Um, very important. 
Oh, well, that's wonderful, George. Thank you for sharing. And it, you'll be back with us another time, okay. next time, I believe. And you'll be talking about how trauma shows up as anxiety. How anxiety shows up, yeah. Right. That dreaded stress in our lives, yeah. Right. Yep. And if you'd like to know more about George and healing trauma, then please go to our website, health wellbeingandlifestyle.com.au Welcome back and now we have Pauline Rooney back with us, our Yoga for Wellbeing instructor and author and today the topic is chair yoga. So Pauline, welcome. Thanks Linda, it's lovely to be back. And chair yoga, how is that, what, what does chair yoga entail? That's a really great question and it's something that many people get confused about and wonder if it's the same or, well it's not the same but it is. That's a bit of a contradiction. If you can do a posture on the floor, you can do it in a chair. And the advantage of doing yoga in a chair is you might have had an injury, you might not feel like getting onto the floor, you may not have the space to get onto the floor, or you might be a little bit more gorgeous in years, so therefore you're unable to get onto the floor. But yoga is all about the three. It's the breathing, it's the posture, and it is the mindset. So therefore, if you can have those three on a mat, you can have those three on a chair. It's very simple to do the same types of things. If you do a back bend on a mat, you can do a back bend on a chair. And it's a matter of the same principle. You lift, you extend your spine, and you take your sternum back. You, a back bend's not leaning back. It's lifting and leaning the spine backward. So therefore, we can do that on a chair. We can do our spinal twists on a chair, just like that. You'd always do it to both sides. Even to the triangle poses in the standing, we won't stand, but you hang on to your chair. I'm a great believer in safety, Linda. If you're on wheels, you must lock them down or have your chair very secure. It's mo safety's paramount. So you'd come out the side of your chair checking the shoulders not up, that it's down, and you'd ease out like that. Now that's a lateral or a side bend to your spine. Same as on the floor. You do that on both sides, you see. So it keeps the body moving. Any movement is good movement. We don't just do the movement and forget about our breath and our mind application to it. So we would say breathe in and turn and breathe out and then breathe naturally and then breathe in and coming back and then breathe out. So your breath movement is the same on the mat as it is in a chair. Forward bends, we can bring the legs out a little bit and stretch our spine. You'd never arch up because you wouldn't do that on the mat. So you extend and you come forward. Ankle work, how often have we heard oh, my ankles are weak and I find it hard to balance or to walk. In your chair, circle your ankles. You'd go both ways and you'd do both ankles and just that gen very gentle movement. That will help. The other one that I really like for bone density, hands back on the chair, right foot always slightly forward and that has to do with the positioning of lifting. When you see people standing, they often come forward and lift like that. That's too much strain. So by putting that foot forward, holding your chair back, you lift from there. It's a straight lift. You can come straight up to stand. But that's enough work. Even if you're unable to lift, you can still push like that. You're still getting the bone density work in your arms. So it's a matter of modifying but creating the same outcome. It's the outcome, it's the intent, your breath, your mindset. Again, you keep your mind focused. If you're on the mat, you're internalizing what you're doing, your breathing, your posture, your alignment. It's exactly the same on the chair. 
you're not thinking about anything else. You're really working into that body part. The other one, we often hear people say, oh, but what about our heart rate, the cardiovasculars? We've got that covered in chair yoga and mat yoga. And I like to call this a tushy swoosh because we're going to hang on and swoosh our tushy from side to side. Slow is great or you can go quite fast. You're safe because you're not standing up and what have you. And your cardiovasculars will pump along quite quite nicely. So there's many of those types of things. You can hang onto your chair and move your feet back and forward. Again, that is fantastic for the ankles, the knees, the hip, also the abdomen, because you're lifting to bring your legs out. So that's working there too. There's many, many things we can do in that chair. All of these will help us in balance. And we all know that we need to balance when we're on our feet. So lifting the leg and extending and swinging back like that, you're strengthening your hip joint muscle area. And therefore, of course, that helps when you stand up, the strength in the hip joint. So I suppose with people, with, with the, especially with late, ongoing over the last several years, with more work being done on computers, from work from home, online, um, no matter what the age group, I suppose that this is, this is something that people can think about when they're having a, even during the work. Oh, most definitely, most definitely. This covers right across the, the range. Children, they're on games. And the average time for children under the age of 16 is eight hours. And that's a lot of screen time on top of their schooling time, right? And then I think at 16 and over, it becomes 15 hours and more. That I'd be very conservative in saying that. And if they're gaming or chatting to friends, they too can do this. And they don't even realise that they're doing something great for their body, you know? It's really important. And I must say, I notice that both of us smile and that's a really good thing to do too, because it takes about 16 muscles to smile and 32 to frown. So it's very harsh on the face <laughs> if you're frowning a little bit too much. So smiling is good. It also changes the mindset, right? So if you're feeling a bit sad and you're sitting there feeling, I'm sad, I'm sad, it doesn't do the mind, the body any good, Linda. So a big smile and a big breath and a little movement will change your day completely. It's really important. The, you know, and teach our children to do these things. If they can learn at a very early age that it's simple to do because they're busy. We're all busy. We don't always have time to get onto the mat every day. We might go to a class, but if we do something every day in the chair, we would notice a huge difference. It'd be fantastic. So what would your best advice be for people could take with them today? Oh, the best tip I could give is what I call juicing up your knees. And our knees get stiff and sore. This one, you blow into your hands, rub them, have your fingers down because that helps to warm up more quickly. Warm them up, cup your hands. We just have the lightly over there and it's like um, a figure eight lying down and we move our knees around like that about seven times, that's all you need to do, and then go back the other way. And I can pretty much guarantee you, you're going to find a huge difference in those knees. They're going to love you so much for juicing them up. It's amazing. If you're in the garden or sitting, anything like that, it's fantastic. Wonderful. Thanks, Pauline. You're very welcome. And we'll be back next week where, um, with more amazing guests. But in the meantime, for more about Pauline Rooney and Yoga for Wellbeing, and particularly chair yoga, then please go to her webpage on our website, healthwellbeingandlifestyle.com.au. And we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.